Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. So pleased to welcome Amber Behrens in support of Grist uh, in conversation this evening with Alex Beggs. Uh, just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us and for all of our attendees. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep the chat window open. So I'll be uh, dropping links to purchase the book from the bookstore throughout the event. Live transcription is available to you as well on your toolbar using the CC icon, where you can also submit questions for the Q&A at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions on your behalf at the conclusion of Abra Analysis Conversation. Uh, as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. If you're joining us much later or not too much later on YouTube, you can be sure to find links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date on all of our events once they become available uh, on our channel. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Abra Behrens is a Michigan chef, author, and former farmer. Through every recipe written and meal served, she aims to tighten the connection between eaters and growers. She believes we can invest in a stronger, more equitable food system for everyone, from producers to grocers to consumers. Her cookbook, Roughage, a practice, a practice guide to vegetables, was a 2019 Michigan Notable Book winner and a James Beard Award nominee. Her dinners at Granner Farms in Three Oaks made her a James Beard semifinalist for our standing chef, Great Lakes. Joining her, Alex Beggs is the senior staff writer at Bon Appetit, where she also writes the magazine's monthly questionable etiquette column. Previously, she was an associate editor at Vanity Fair and has contributed to Into the Gloss, The Cut, The New York Times, and The New Yorker's Daily Shouts. Please join me in welcoming Alex Beggs and Abra Behrens into your living rooms. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, Abra. Hey, Alex. How's it going? Good. I was just thinking about how much has happened in the past few months since your book came out. You had a baby. I, did. I got a haircut. <laughs> I, don't else ha I don't know anything else that happened in that time. <laughs> That's all I can remember. <laughs> but as people have, have gotten cooking from Grist, have I, I'm just kind of nosy. What have you noticed like that there's a popular recipe that you're getting tagged in on Instagram? Um, the, I was surprised to see the Fari Zotto with pork meatballs has been a fan favorite. Um, and then around the holidays, the um, barley flour thumbprint cookies were like showing up, which made me really happy because they're one of my favorites. So, yeah. Yeah. Why do you think the, the pork meatballs? Uh, I mean, it's probably just the photo, honestly, like it's this, um, dance, uh, orange kind of vintage pot with this like bright red risotto and like made with farro and then the pork meatballs or whatever. And, you know, it's funny because the first time I made that to test it, Eric, uh, my husband said, it tastes a little bit like SpaghettiOs. And uh, I was like, you know, it actually does taste a little bit like SpaghettiOs and that feels really good. So I feel like the SpaghettiO, uh, you know, vibe really carried through. <laughs> <laughs> so folks who are here with us, Abra did not want to sit here and sell her <laughs> book, even though that is the point of what we're doing. Um, <laughs> But she's doing a very good job of it so far because that recipe is amazing. And I am personally obsessed with this cookbook. I wrote a review of it for Bon Appetit if you want to read it to be convinced further to buy it. But I will also tell you um, why it's amazing real quick before we get chatting on other stuff. I just want to I want to make sure um, you guys know what we're talking about. It is a huge book. For a cookbook, it, it's about, it looks the same size, but inside are a lot more recipes than usual because what Abra does is at the end of every recipe, there's a, I don't know if it's always three variations that kind of change the flavors and kind of change seasonally 
uh, the base recipe that you're working with. So you, so you end up getting hundreds of recipes out of this book. And if something sounds good, but you might not have all the ingredients, usually you do in the variations. So I love how extremely versatile it is. Plus the recipes don't have that many ingredients. And <laughs> the, so I was, I think I said something like the ingredients are kept to a minimum flavor to the maximum um, because I guess I was writing a movie tagline <laughs> for your book. But along the way, you accidentally learn a lot about all of these be beans and grains, a lot of them grown right here in Michigan, if you're a Michigander listening. And I think um, it could have been a really boring book, but Abra is a very <laughs> good writer and it, she makes it interesting and never boring. And, and I kind of feel sometimes when I'm reading, it's like very warm, like it's written by your overly generous neighbor who brings you cookies when she's made too many. And uh, <laughs> I don't have a neighbor like that, but I want to be that neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my pitch for why you should buy it. I love it. I bought so many at the holidays for everyone. I love that. I think I've kept your new baby in diapers for like at least one more week. <laughs> Which <laughs> great book for you. Burns, burns through them. So <laughs> Oh, you, you, your baby probably is so is like just full of beans, just a little <laughs> butter bean. It certainly sounds like it. That's something I didn't realize uh, before having a baby is that uh, baby farts are as loud as adult farts. Uh, and so you'll just have this like sweet little cooing thing that is like, he's now starting to smile, which is great. And he'll, he'll just like, uh, kind of have a like, you know, look on his face like consternation and then it turns out he just has to fart and then it's so loud and so long and ridiculous and then he just looks at you and goes hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it's pretty amazing <laughs> it's like we inherently know from yeah. when we were born that farts are funny like you can't deny it it's totally <laughs> in your body yeah <laughs> um, so I want to tell you um, the last recipe I made from Grist because I haven't made them all yet. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I have the whole rest of my life to do so. But the, the grits with mushroom cream sauce and greens, and I had never made grits the way you make grits. Can you tell us about it? Yeah. So this was one of the things, you know, in addition to wanting to, you know, just provide good recipes and connect people to the growers. One of the things I, I really want to do with these works is to try to take some information from years in restaurant kitchens and then send them into people's home kitchens. So this is a way to cook grits um, or polenta that um, we used to do at the restaurant. Cause if you've tried to cook polenta and grits before, usually it's like long and slow at over low heat. And so I was doing that at first and all of the, it would always burn, even if there wasn't dairy in it, it always scorches the bottom. Um, and then also it would bubble, but in this way where it would spit like, you know, molten hot magma polenta on your arm and it always hits your arm and never hits the stove. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it got so irritating that finally at one point I like just, turned off the burner and was like, got too busy to deal with the pot. And by the time, and it had, they hadn't been cooking that long. It literally just came back up to a boil. And then I turned it off, put a lid on it and dealt with it after the kind of busy lunch service. And lo and behold, they were totally cooked great, you know, and no burning, no scorching. And so I was afraid that it wouldn't work in a smaller volume because I thought maybe you have to do, you know, 20 quarts of, of polenta to make it work. But then I started doing it at home and it works great. And it's not, I mean, there is still something to be said for the long and slow cooked polenta, but um, this gets it for me. And it has a little bit more texture to it, which I kind of like, and it's really easy. So a lot of times too, I'll, the, the, the technique I should actually say is you bring water to a boil, four parts water to one part grits. Um, and then uh, shoot the cornmeal in and bring it back up to a boil and be sure it has a good stir so that it's not clumpy, turn it off and put the lid on it and just let it sit for like 20 or 30 minutes. And it just rehydrates on the back of the stove. Um, and so it's really, really simple. And that's the yeah. And, and you put that over there and then cut up all your other stuff for dinner or go answer some emails, or if you're me, you're like watching TikTok. 
but <laughs> it's so hands off and I've made it in the oven before too, but I mm. much prefer this. I like, I like, you know, it, I don't have to keep an eye on it. Mm. Um, and also the mushroom cream sauce, which is one of the, in the front of the book, there are all these amazing condiments. Um, I think if you still haven't bought this book yet and we're <laughs> 12 minutes in, the recipe for the bacon vinaigrette alone is worth the whole book because I love it on everything. But the mushroom cream sauce is another one of the amazing sauces, condiments, um, like nut toppings that Abra puts in the front of the book that are, you know, if even if you're not making the full on recipe, those are such, I think you just have that in the fridge, you put it on everything because it's mushrooms and heavy cream. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a wine. So, it's another restaurant recipe that um, it, it's amazingly stable. Like I, I feel like I always grew up with cream sauces, like breaking on um, my mom, like when she would, you know, make a bechamel or something like that. And, um, and this one, I don't know exactly what it is. There's something about the acidity in the white wine. So you sweat some onions, add some white wine and bring it all the way down and then add some cream and reduce it again by like, I don't anywhere. I mean, you can kind of bring it to any point, but there's something about that acidity that stabilizes it. And so you can make it and reheat it and it reheats great. I often use it, um, as I like to just kind of softly, like this time of year, the spinach is pretty tender. And so I'll just pour that hot cream sauce over spinach and just let the heat of it kind of gently will. And it always holds really well. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That makes it, you don't even have to saute the spinach. It's just going to, mm -hmm it's going to well right there. Couldn't be easier. <laughs> um, and I got the most amazing cornmeal from Ernst farm, which is at the Carytown farmer's market here, like that you can get this local cornmeal it has so much flavor. Um, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm got, I'm going through a cornmeal phase, uh, I'm being <laughs> acquainted with it after having a lot of Jiffy mix as a kid. And, yeah. and so we could talk about cooking all night, but also, um, I love talking to you about American cooking culture, farm culture, all of these other bigger things that revolve around what you cook about. Um, so I, I wanted, I was curious in your, you did so much research for this book and cornmeal and corn products. I don't know, that has gotta be the number one most produced food item in America in agriculture, right? Corn? Well it's weird because I, uh, you know, so I, people, I think are kind of bemoan the corn and soy monocultures in our ag system, but most of that corn does not go into human food. It's, you know, ethanol or used for animal silage or all of those different corn starch, you know, things like that. Um, and so most corn meals that we're eating are from, I. Uh, you know, a smaller breed of corn. Um, and I don't know, I, I'm pretty doubtful that any of like the big, you know, thousand acre growers are, are making cornmeal or polenta out of their corn. Maybe a processor does, like maybe a processor like a Quaker or something would buy corn from the same commodity market. Um, it would have to be cleaned differently. So, um, you know, what happened, something I found really fascinating in this book is that um, ingredients like any of these seeds, corn especially, has to be cleaned differently for animal consumption, human consumption, or distilling, or biodiesel, all of those things where they're going to go through a different kind of manufacturing. Um, so most of the corn, and I imagine what you're getting from Ernst or what we get from Grainer or from Meadowlark um, is going to be what's called an open pollinated corn, um, which means that it's it's not a GMO or a, um, a hybrid corn. So it has to be able to be open pollinated. Um, and that's usually some of the older varieties. So we've been making cornmeal out of uh, a variety called Wapsie Valley, which is really beautiful and tasty um, and, and things like that. So yeah, it's a, it's one of those things, the, all of these ingredients are so ubiquitous and so humble in some ways, but then they have a lot of nuance to them, especially in their production or how they're used in, in situations. Yeah. I got two types of cornmeal the last time I was at farm club, the Wapsie Valley and bloody butcher mm -hmm. and Nick, the farmer there, he was describing the two of them to me in such detail. And like, if you've ever just like bought Quaker grits or Quaker cornmeal, 
and, and then you taste these, it's, it's amazing how much they just taste. They have more flavor generally. And that flavor is corn, but it's sweet and like kind of earthy and you really notice it in a way you don't notice it, um, with those other. So, so I think those are, are worth seeking out and you can now get a lot of I know you can buy Bloody Butcher online. I don't know about the Wapsi. I assume so. They're easier to find online now. Yeah, Wapsi Valley is coming along. I, I think um, some of the Hopi Blues and Bloody Butcher have been further ahead because they're a really beautiful color and also the names are great. Um, and Wapsi Valley is from, it originated in Iowa with a family who um, developed that seed and it it's a beautiful kernel. It looks like candy corn, um, like from Halloween. And it has that sort of color gradation. And yeah, it's a beautiful Midwestern corn as well. But I think it's just a little less known. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because so Nick is also, I mean, he's a farmer, but he's also like a baker and a miller and a like, you know, chef savant, you know, as well as like, an well economist. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Make some, laughs> like, you know, sauna builder, general contractor, you name it. Um, if anybody is up in Lelano County, um, we're talking about Nick Tyson from Loma Farm and who's also a co-owner at Farm Club. Um, but he, you know, he mills all that corn there, or they do at Farm Club. And um, one of the things that also, you know, these ingredients, again, are so simple and so humble, that something as simple as how it is milled, uh, will change it pretty dramatically. So, you know, cornmeal that you would use in like a cornbread, or I've been using like a really fine cornmeal to dredge tofu when I fry tofu, it gives it this really nice crunchy outside. Um, that's going to be really finely ground. Um, and corn flour, which, um, you know, would get, it's not exactly corn starch because that has a different process to it, but that's going to be like super finely milled. Um, and then as you get coarser, it has these other names. So grits is kind of in the middle and then polenta is the coarsest. And then there's also different varieties of corn, everything from like a dent corn or a flint corn, which is different than sweet corn. And, you know, there's, there's all of this nuance in it, um, which can make it sort of confusing, but also feels like we should just have more names for stuff, but then sometimes the more names makes it confusing too. So. Right. I mean, I can't even keep grits versus polenta. I use them interchangeably, grits and polenta. Like, I was like, what? They're the same thing, right? They're the same. Yeah, I think so. I'm not from the South. So you, you, you grew up in Texas, but are grits a thing in Texas? I grew, I didn't have polenta probably till I moved to New York when I was 18. Okay. Yeah, so I only had grits. And then when you shop, even Bob's Red Mill, it's grits and polenta on the same package. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't even... I don't even know what, I guess I use them pretty interchangeably too. Um, and it's interesting because I, the, you know, there's a, there's some essays in the book as well. And the one about corn is I, I'm a big Jim Harrison fan and he wrote a piece for Esquire that was about, um, how, you know, he was making polenta for his mom, who was a real no nonsense sort of lady. And, uh, she was like, what's that? I don't need that. And he was like, oh, it's cornmeal mush. We call it polenta now. And she was like, cornmeal mush is fine by me. And it's, it's an interesting sort of track to go because I think a lot of restaurants will use other languages to kind of zhuzh up the description of the dish. Um, but then also there's sort of a stubbornness that can come with, you know, calling something cornmeal mush. It doesn't, it doesn't always win you any favors. Um, but so it sort of begs the question, like, are, are these, is that distinction important? Is it not? Is it all kind of the same thing? You know? And so I think I ended up using corn porridge as the, like, <laughs> the catch all for it, just to add another, another slice of the pie. Well, it's interesting to think about like the, even the word grits sounds mm. gritty and sandy. Mm. It, it is a tough word for tough people. Mm -hmm. um, so I like grits, but I, I think it's interesting that, yeah. And then polenta, it's got this like Italian Eurocentric mm -hmm. nice thing going on for it. But it kind of reminds me too of the name of your book because it's an anagram <laughs> of it, but also that like you could have called your book something like, you know, beautiful, 
like this long sentence about like life changing power of grain. <laughs> but you went with grist, and the other book is roughage. And <laughs> I think that these are they're interesting word choices. How, where did you pick? Why grist? Well, I wanted to continue uh, the sort of theme from roughage, which is sort of like a tongue in cheek, uh, sounds bad, but tastes good kind of idea. Um, And I actually wanted to call the book either fodder or silage. And uh, the the wiser folks at Chronicle were like, absolutely not. (laughs) We're not calling this silage. Um, And so, uh, yeah, grist became kind of the next go to because it you know, it felt like an active word. It has a, you know, nod to the process of of milling something into flour and something to chew on, you know, grist for the mill. Um, and, And this book really does deal with a lot of sort of the social issues around supply chain and things like that, not only because it was written during the pandemic and the um, racial justice uh, protests, um, but it also is just at a time where it's time to talk about these things because these are shelf stable pantry items that can be shipped without a ton of resource besides the actual shipping as opposed to like refrigeration and moving water around and stuff like that. But, um, you know, they're, and they're part of the conversation, you know, around plant-based proteins and things like that. So it felt like there was a lot to kind of chew on and digest in this book, uh, outside of just the, the recipes themselves. Yeah, I think there's a line, I'm not sure somewhere in the intro or or just something I think about a lot, which is um, the accessibility of food. And we, you know, think about this a lot of Bon Appetit, like, you know, who can make this recipe? How much are the, I tested a recipe that used a lot of Gruyere cheese. And when I cross-tested the recipe, it was like $30 worth of cheese. And I was like, yeah. you're going to have to maybe say cheddar as an alternative, because that's insane. Um, yeah. And, and with, and with the talking about air, especially like heirloom grains and beans, which if you do buy the cornmeal online, might be really expensive. And mm-hmm. yet it's, you know, a pretty simple product. It's more affordable at the farmer's market where I have the privilege of walking up to it and getting it that not everyone in the country has. Mm-hmm. And then there's a situation with beans where like we like swoon over Rancho Gordo beans because they're beautiful and amazing, but buying a handful of those online ain't cheap either. So, right. so it's kind of, I don't know if you, how you navigate talking about that or thinking about it in the book and, you know, trying not to yeah. make it snobby. Well, and that was a big part of the like being intro was um, just realizing that all of a sudden there was all of this like social media fanfare around cooking a pot of beans and then seeing like a a bean sweatshirt advertise. uh, As I was scrolling through Instagram, I saw like, you know, four or five people posting their bean cooking pots and then this t-shirt or sweatshirt came up and I was just like, oh no, this is becoming the like latest humble ingredient that is now, you know, snobby. And there's, you know, the, the La Preferida or La Goya beans are like not good enough anymore. And, and so I think a couple of things about it, I think one, um, compared to well-raised meat, uh, beans are still pretty affordable. And especially if they can stretch over multiple meals easier than like a pork roast can. Um, and so I think on the whole, it's not like, you know, demanding that people buy saffron or vanilla at this point, you know, um, but I also think there's, you know, again, kind of that deep dive of nuance in the ingredient itself where, um, I don't have any issue with people buying the La Preferida dried beans or canned beans, honestly. Um, You know, they're not going to get that or the Quaker cornmeal. They're not going to get that same flavor um, depth uh, or, you know, they don't always cook as quickly or as evenly. But for the most part, they work great and they're good options. Um, And then if you get excited about that and you want to dive in, then there's kind of this like secondary world of those beans. And um, yeah, I don't know. It just sort of feels like I, I, I struggle with the idea of how much people spend on food because I don't want 
any of these recipes to feel out of reach of working class people who either live where they're walking to a corner store or they're in a rural small town grocery store. Um, that said, we also don't spend that much on food as a society. And so, you know, that has the amount of our income, not even disposable income, but just our income that is spent on food has gone down, you know, every decade since the twenties where it was at what, like 30 or 40%, I forget what the statistic is. And so, I don't know. I mean, I guess I feel like it's okay to spend a little bit more on food. It's like one of the few things I buy that actually goes inside my body. Um, and so like, I'm willing to spend like a thousand dollars on this thing and then, you know, to shortcut it on the stuff that I eat every day. But I don't know, that gets into class. And I feel like you can, this was like something I really grappled with the book is like, you can't, talk about food access without talking about class. And so most of these issues are targeted at sort of, I mean, our demographic, like, you know, middle-class, middle-aged, like white folks um, who are willing to pay $35 for a cookbook um, and then use it. And I think it gets really tricky when that demographic starts sort of telling others how they should eat. Um, and so I don't know, I don't have a good answer, but it's, it's tricky. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> I thought that was a good answer. I don't have any answers. <laughs> I only have questions. <laughs> Moderator ever, stop. <laughs> um, oh my God. And I'm going to pull you in and be like, I know there's answers in you. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I guess about how it. I feel about, oh, sorry. How, I guess how I feel about food access stuff is uh, let's pay everybody enough that they can buy the best food. You know, like it just, that seems like a good, a good stepping stone. And um, I think a lot about, you know, my friend Elliot went to Cuba a few years ago and he was saying how struck he was by this feeling. There was like, he was hearing from people that there's like this iron ceiling on what you can achieve in that, in that system. And this is one person's account. So I don't, I don't, I can't speak for it to myself, but I remember him saying that phrase, an iron ceiling. And I was just thinking like, what if we had an iron floor where even like the, like laziest, most deadbeat, like schlub doesn't go hungry, you know? And like, is still can, is able to get a job where they can earn enough to like buy medicine, pay their rent, and eat food. It seems like that's something we should be able to do. But. Right, and with all the like, all the stories about the Great Resignation, all these people quitting, that it's like maybe finally time, maybe workers finally have like a say in how much they're worth, which is just like whoa, wild. <laughs> yeah, it's a wild time right now where it feels like there's this like moment of power in in workers' rights, and yet it's not particularly organized like it's not the union uh systems of the past it's it's something else and it feels very decentralized and I don't I don't know I mean I think it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out and how restaurant culture changes how food culture changes around that and and also I mean not only just workers like bowing out but I feel like more and more chefs that I talk to like are suddenly really giving a shit about who eats at their restaurants and, you know, not kind of making space for folks who aren't going to wear a mask. If that's your, if you have a mask policy in place or who aren't going to be gracious or who aren't, we're going to take tipping out of the equation. And I don't know. I mean, I don't have a sense of what's right or wrong with that, but um, it, it's, it's interesting to see just kind of the, like, everything's been thrown in the air and we'll see what lands. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, um, I don't really have a good segue here other than I'm just keeping an eye on the clock and I want to make sure oh, yeah. I ask you a couple questions, but <laughs> welcome theory, to because, our three hour webinar. <laughs> my seamless transition is, um, I recently read a book called the fate of food by Amanda Little, who is a science Ooh. journalist. Have you, have you read that one? It came out. I haven't, but I, I want to read it. You would like it. It's, it's an, Anybody else interested in our food systems? Um, it is it is about the how climate change will uh, climate change and like 
extreme weather generally in the coming years will affect our food systems. And it's not just like, oh, droughts are gonna make avocados go extinct. But what she does is she talks to um, people in the technology world who are working on the solutions to those problems. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like she sees the problems and she's talking about how people are planning for them. And she talks to um, a Michigan, shucks to a Michigan apple farmer mm -hmm. who talks about these like fans that they, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for these fans that will help circulate warm air so that when these unexpected freezes happen, they, they won't lose the entire crop of apples. And this, that is a long wind up to me asking you sure. when you talk to all the farmers for the book, did any of them mention how climate change has been affecting their crop? Because especially in Michigan, it's for real, stuff's happening. It is for real. And, and that was, so for those of you who haven't read the book, throughout the book, there are these farmer profiles, which are, uh, you know, written in a question and answer format and really meant to kind of contextualize from a grower or producer's perspective, how these ingredients come to the table. And um, I think the one, the interview that deals with it the most, although all of them touch on it, I mean, even if they're not using the phrase climate change or climate collapse, like just navigating the weather has always been the peril of farmers um, and it's becoming ever more so. Um, but Rachel Roche, who is the rice grower in Louisiana, she talks about it very frankly. And she's, I mean, because she's on the front lines of that, I mean, hurricane seasons are changing dramatically where she is. And she was like listing how, cause I don't know anything about growing rice until talking with her. Um, and she was just listing all of the like steps in the year. And she was like, yeah. And you know, rice, usually comes due like in August and September, which is also hurricane season. And so, you know, you baby this crop all the way up until the point where you're about to harvest it and then a hurricane comes, you know? And so it really, it really is affecting in that way. And so I think that there is, I'm always fascinated by the sort of like um, Teddy Roosevelt conservationists that are out there, you know? And I think that um, American farmers are, in a lot of ways, an untapped resource as uh, you know, people to advocate and to push for uh, climate solutions. Because if if we provide as and this is a governmental policy, and this isn't really a consumer policy, you know, financial incentive for growers to plant cover crop, we're going to see much less erosion and fewer algae blooms in the Mississippi Delta. It's just how it goes. I mean, agriculture is responsible for, I forget what the number is, but something like uh, some high percentage of greenhouse gas emissions and, um, you know, cover cropping, crop rotation, things like that will help with that. And, you know, there's, there are people who work with nature and want to be sure that it, it works. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of space for administrations. And thankfully in Michigan, Senator Debbie, Debbie Stabenow is the, um, you know, the leader of the Ag Committee and she does incredible work for Michigan farmers, whether you vote Democratic or not, she's got your back and she's looking at a lot of those solutions. And it's, in, it's a, usually a very bipartisan uh, committee in, in the Senate, which is amazing. Yeah, how rare. <laughs> it's unreal, yeah. And and do you guys do anything at Grainer? I mean, it's a organic farm. I, I actually like probably didn't know what a cover crop was until a year ago. So I don't know if you want to talk about what you guys are up to. Yeah, so the grain program at Grainer is run by Wesley Reith and Andrew Harris. And um, they, you know, they know more about the ins and outs than I do. But my understanding is that there's a really extensive crop rotation and they have flexibility in their crop plans. So a few years ago, it was too wet to get a lot of stuff in in time to, you know, you have to plant it by a certain amount of time to have to harvest it before frost that there's a lot of calendars and dates you have to hit based on, you know, historical numbers for the weather. Um, and it was way too wet. It was a super wet spring. It had been a wet winter, it had been a wet fall. And so by the time spring came around, you know, there was no way to get into a lot of these fields. And so Wes pivoted and put a lot of them into buckwheat. Um, and there, there wasn't 
we didn't have the ability at the time to be able to harvest the buckwheat. And so it just got tilled in and became a green manure um, that, you know, adds that nitrogen back into the soil. So yeah, certainly there's lots of tools. And I think that's the other thing that was so like beautifully heartbreaking about these farmer interviews was that in their own way, each person I interviewed said, when I said, you know, what do you want people to know that aren't farmers? And they said something along the lines of, we're smart and we have to like, you know, work through creative solutions all the time, every season, no season is different. You make a change, you don't see a difference for a year, you know, all of those things. And I just, I hope that people get some sense of that and feel like there's this fleet of, of people doing this work in a really sensitive and thoughtful way for what it's worth. Yeah. The seed cleaner in the book who says just to, I just wish people knew I existed or we existed. And you're just yeah. like, Oh damn. Yeah. And then you're thinking, I had no idea that seed cleaners existed. And now okay. I do. And it makes <laughs> me appreciate the food a little more, but yeah. this, you know, the regenerative cover crop plants um, that are good for the soil comes up in the book and kind of, and it's just like, here's lentils and here's way to cook lentils and they're delicious. And by the way, they're amazing cover crops. So I think mm-hmm. you do an interesting job of, of, of telling us about these things. So it's like, you know, I'm not, it's, you're encouraged to eat more buckwheat if you've only maybe had it in kasha or something. And, um, because it had, you know, by supporting it in your own individual way, you're creating a demand, um, that hopefully has some minor effect on our planet that we may have ruined. (laughs) So, yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, I think that, you know, anybody who's tuned into this obviously understands a small business and the support for a small business like Literati, but that's also true with your food choices. And um, I am working on a fruit book um, and I was doing an interview on that. And um, my neighbor, Jean Garthy, who's a organic cherry grower up in Northport was saying that the difference between 2019 tart cherry prices and 2020 was uh, 12 cents a pound to like 45 cents a pound. Um, and that was based exclusively because by the time 2020 rolled around, all of the like uh, national strategic reserves of cherry pie filling had been depleted because people were baking at home so much that all of a sudden there was this massive demand. And so, you know, the idea that consumers really do play a role in the system is, is very true. And, and your power as a consumer is nothing to sneeze at. It's, it's different than governmental policies and things that we should be pushing our representatives to ag- advocate for, but we have a lot of power too. Um, well, uh, I know we're going to ask questions in five minutes, so I want to pivot to this hard hitting series of rapid fire questions I prepared for you. And I didn't know this was going to go on YouTube. So I was, and because I guess I'm small, locally minded, I was like, this is going to be tons of Michiganders listening. So these are kind of Michigan themed and if people don't get it I'm really sorry you're gonna <laughs> you should move to Michigan. google everything I say you be happy you did um okay so I'll start with an easy one okay. uh, what did you have for lunch today I had for lunch it was interesting actually so I very rarely use cookbooks. Uh, like I use them, I flip through them for inspiration and then I'll get like some proportions and then I never follow the recipe, but I'm trying to actually cook from some of the cookbooks that I have. And I just got the new Anna Jones book, which is like one pot, one pan, one planet or whatever. Um, and there's, I am using that. She uses a lot of flavors that I'm not super familiar with. So there's a tamarind, uh, glazed eggplant dish, uh, in there. So I made that a couple nights ago for dinner. And I had the leftovers of that with, um, some spinach and, uh, chili crisp and an avocado. And that book is very on theme with what we were talking about climate minded. It's about, um, food waste, uh, which is, uh, it seems like an individual problem we have in our fridges, but, uh, it adds up in a crazy way, especially yeah. well, I'm getting off topic. Mm-hmm. Okay. That sounds good. Um, what is something forgotten deep in the back of your freezer? 
Ooh, uh, you know, there's actually still frozen lima beans and soybeans from the grist photo shoot, which happened in 2020. <laughs> and I know this because they were recently not forgotten because Eric hurt his knee. And so he was using it to, <laughs> to ice his knee. And I was like, oh yeah, those are there. <laughs> if the oldest thing in your freezer is from 2020, I am I'm, I'm so impressed. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's yeah. definitely, I did have, so when I was in my nesting phase before having Lark, uh, which was like two days beforehand, I was like, oh, we're going to have an, like a C-section in a couple of days. I should quick take these two containers of ghost pepper puree that I've had you know, I moved them from Chicago to Michigan, which was five years ago. And my friend gave them to me when she moved to Santa Fe, which was like 12 years ago. I, and I was like, quick, ferment these into hot sauce. Like, that's what I needed to do right then. Uh, but I was like, I'm going to need space in this freezer. This is ridiculous. I can't have these 12 year old ghost peppers anymore. Uh, and then of course I like, didn't do it very well because I was rushing around. And so it got moldy. So the We'll see if the bottom part has survived, but <laughs> I thought you were gonna say that you made like ghost pepper baby food or something insane. <laughs> <laughs> just, really, just terrible to this child. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get him acclimated. Okay. Uh now on to the really hard questions. Uh cool ranch or nacho cheese? Cool ranch. What is the best sandwich at Zingerman's? Uh, well, it used to be my sandwich, uh, the Abra is not a yard bird, but they took it off when they trimmed their menu. So I would say that the best, I know, uh, the best sandwich is a 13 O roll, like, so modifications, 13 on an onion roll and grilled, or you can do the, um, number 54, which is the barbecue chicken, uh, but adding roasted red pepper sauce and with American cheese and grilled. Those are the ones. I knew you would have a very thorough answer. <laughs> <laughs> number 40. <laughs> 40. Okay. What is Michigan's greatest dive bar? Well, I live in near Three Oaks now, so I would say Nelson's Saloon in Three Oaks is up there. Um, also Brady's in Traverse City. Uh, real good one. Love it. Wait, is Nelson's one that sells pie? Yes. Handwritten <laughs> post-it note on the like artwork. Yeah. Every night do they have pie or is it like a special pie? No, they do. They change, they change periodically. So, but yeah, there's always a handwritten and like beautiful church lady cursive on a post-it note stuck to the like Bud Light art that's at the end of each booth. Yeah. That's from my good. Michigan bucket list. Um, <laughs> okay. These ones will be fast. Whitefish dip or fried smelt? Ooh, uh, fried smelt because it's easy. I don't know. Yeah. It depends. You, Both. you, you have to live with your answer. <laughs> um, pierogies or pasties? I mean, pasties. Wow. I know I eat pierogies more, but a pasty, I mean, you can't beat a pasty. It's a special occasion. Um, <laughs> apple cider donut or cherry fritter? Apple cider donut. Wow. American spoon or Kilwin's fudge? Uh, American spoon. Mackinac Island or Sleeping Bear Dunes? I mean, Sleeping Bear Dunes, but it depends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> depends on my mood yeah, exactly. um, and then it depends last, on what type of fudgy you want to see what's up the last question is uh better made or fago the fago you know i did not see see it going there but <laughs> rock and rye calls um, rock and, and rye is so good or the moon mist i loved moon mist growing up um, but yeah. And also, I mean, I know we were talking about Jiffy Mix earlier. That's an Ypsilanti product, right? It's made near or Dexter, right? Um, and I still think it's like, I mean, there's an all corn cornbread recipe in the book, which I think is good and it's good for gluten-free folks. Uh, but I mean, Jiffy Mix is really good cornbread. I, um, have had enough of it. It's probably like in my DNA at this point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I won't, I won't, I won't distract us from our assignment, which is to answer questions, I think. All right. Yes, Jiffy was a common uh, field trip destination growing up. Uh, oh, really? Fun. Yeah. You got, and you got free little corn muffins and like uh, mix to take home. It was, 
Yeah. I also I felt like, like they would take us there anytime they ran out of ideas for things to do with us. <laughs> we would end up back at the Jiffy plant. I'm just picturing <laughs> a kid like Willy Wonka style just falling into a vat of cornmeal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kellogg yeah, is not too far from us. So I mean, it was similar, just like frosted flakes galore. That's awesome. <laughs> we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, I would encourage our audience to submit more questions if they have them, please don't be shy. Uh, our first question, um, a viewer asks, how has your experience as a farmer changed your habits with food waste? You know, we were talking about, or ref- we were talking about food waste a bit earlier tonight. Uh, I mean, it made me really care about food waste because of the, the amount, seeing the amount of work that goes into growing even the most like basic thing, like an onion or garlic or, you know, any of these grains. Um, and so it, it made me really resistant to letting that happen. Um, and so I think, but it also, I have an interesting relationship with food waste because as someone who works at a farm, um, my, you know, it's, it's much more often that I'll get like 50 pounds of squat of winter squash that have like a dent in them. And so they won't store that well. And so some of the recipes that show up in roughage and again, in grist to a lesser degree are ways to process like a lot of volume in a quick amount of time. And, uh, my friend Francis was like, yeah, but we don't normally have 50 pounds of squash that need to be cooked right away. And I was like, really? That's weird. Uh, and so I think it's it's about kind of seeing how uh, there, there's different scales to the food waste. And it's been interesting working on this fruit book because fruit seems to be one of the things that people waste the most and looking for ways yeah. to, to kind of keep that, um, you know, give people tools for that. So yeah, I think it's mostly just caring about it. And then also, I guess, farming, you're so hungry that you'll pretty much eat anything. So even if it's on the way out, you can just kind of hoover it down. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, the thing that you said about dense, though, in in this book, The Fate of Food, she talks about food waste a lot and and startups like Imperfect Foods, where you can buy a, 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 a a box full of like slightly imperfect produce to keep it from going to waste. But what I learned was that when fruits and vegetables are put under stressful situations um, in the field, the things that like make them look imperfect, Mm -hmm. uh, they overproduce some of like the vitamins and antioxidants Mm -hmm. to make up for that. So sometimes those are more healthy than the other ones. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to trust that that is true. And (laughs) I'll buy the dented apple tomorrow. I swear. Yeah, there's a book called Eating on the Wild Side by Joe Robinson, I think, that talks about like ways that plants sort of activate their micronutrients to protect themselves that then you and, you know, get when you ingest it so um and there the one i remember is um the the dark leafy greens their darkness is directly correlated to the amount of sun that they get it's like their version of sunscreen and so you get more antioxidants the darker the greens are because they were trying to you know protect themselves from the sun and so you can kind of correct your sun damage it's just wild to me like so smart plants yeah totally crazy Sarah asks, uh, now that you have had all these eyes on your second book, baby, have there been any parts where you said yikes or whoops from anything small, tiny misprint to larger, big amendment or something you'd add or strike that you'd like to share with this eager audience? Uh, That's interesting. It sounds like I missed something in a recipe and Sarah's wondering if I figured that out yet or not, Um, which is actually interesting. There was an Amazon review that said that some things were missing and I was like, please tell me so that we can fix it in the reprint. So Sarah, uh, feel free to email me if there's something specific that you've noticed. Um, I mean, I think I've thought a lot about, there's an essay at the beginning about meat consumption and um, it really is, it, it's meant to sort of be a little bit convoluted um, because the decision is convoluted and and the thinking behind it is it, it goes through lots of iterations. And so I tried to write it as succinctly as possible, but also expressing that there's not a perfect answer. And I sort of wish I had just said that, that like there's not a perfect answer. So you have to try to decide for yourself. And these are the things that I think about um, because it, I think several people have said that that's like a cringy page or a cringy essay. And 
you know, I'm open to that as a possibility. It, it was really me grappling with something and, and wanting to sort of show, I think there's a lot of times in food media where it's like, this is the thing that you're supposed to think. And this is, I've like cracked the nut and I don't feel like we have cracked that nut. Um, so I wish maybe I had done that a little bit better. Um, you know, the, we were waiting on the forward for a bit and it got pretty close to print. So the page opposite the forward uh, is just blank and it should have a photograph there, you know, so we'll fix that in the reprint, um, things like that. But that's really it. You know, this book was a harder book to write both for myself because it was a lot more research, um, but then also everybody was working on it from their homes. And so, you know, there's, there's a several series of grids in the book that are, sort of like how to build a pot of stewed beans, you know, that you can use lots of different ingredients to build it, but the technique is the same. And so I wanted to flesh that out in a different way than I ever did in roughage. And um, those were surprisingly difficult to, to do collaboratively across Zoom calls. Um, and so I think it shows up there. And, and I did get some criticism that the book feels could feel dated because of how much uh, emphasis there is on the pandemic and the racial justice protests. But I don't know. I don't think this pandemic is going to feel dated anytime soon. Like it's really real. And we're just, un we're not even understanding how it's affected our lives and, and for better or for worse. I mean, it's a, it's a moment in time and that's fine. Um, so I don't know. It's like I, I hear that criticism and I understand it. And it's interesting writing something really permanent, like a book where you just have to kind of draw a line in the sand, I guess. But but if there's something that you're missing specifically, you know, my email is barons.abra at gmail.com. Like, please send me an email. Let me know. But if Sarah says that there's to notice nothing wrong at all. She's just Oh, okay. truly curious. She's just, um, yeah, just fashion. waiting to see what I had <laughs> Kelly, I uh, Kelly asks any hint when the fruit cookbook will be released? Oh yes. Spring of 2023 uh, is what we're scheduled at right now. And spring is kind of a broad category. So we'll see what happens um, in terms of all of these, these shipping woes and everything. <laughs> but um, yeah, the book has been written and the, uh, Photography has been shot. The illustrations still need to be done. Um, Lucy Engelman is going to do it again, which is great. And then there are going to be some more of these producer interviews and I'm finishing those up now. So yeah, we'll get it buttoned up in the next couple months or so. Can I guess the title? Oh yeah, sure. There's been a lot of debate about this one. Okay. Is it Pith? That was on the list. Uh, it was certainly on the list. I wanted to call it Seedy. Um, because the book is uh, equal parts sweet and savory recipes. And so I was like, oh, seedy and unsavory and, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. But uh, what we've landed on right now is pulp. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> just keeping the gross theme going. But yeah, Pith was definitely on the list. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm so glad. I like pulp. Um Deborah asks, I've grown scarlet runner beans the past four years and finally have enough for a side dish. No joke. <laughs> the beans are stored in a small glass jar. They look okay, but how long can dry beans be stored? You know, a good long time. So if you're drying them yourself, uh, probably the issue you'd run into would be mold um, because I, at least that's what's happened to me is that I don't dry them quite enough. And so I tend to store mine in the freezer. Um, but if yours are doing fine, then they're great. And one of the things, actually, I was talking with Grace Singleton um, at Zingerman's about the kind of retail expectations of these dried pulses. And she was saying that the beans that are on the bottom shelf at the grocery store often have anywhere from two to five years um, on them. And so that's why a lot of times if you've ever cooked a, a pot of beans and, you know, one is rock hard and the other one has gone to mush, it's because they're different ages. But that, I mean, that to me says the last a good long time, five years or so. Um, so yeah, I don't think you're in any danger of them going bad. Um, they're not like nuts. They don't have that same sort of oil in them. That's going to go rancid. Um, and so really the, the older they are, 
the more you'll have to rehydrate them when you cook them, which is, is why soaking is like a recommended thing because it rehydrates the beans before you put them in the pot on the stove. And then also it tends to equalize beans of different ages at the same time. Great. Thank you. We have one more question, a um, bit of a, maybe an addendum to the rap rapid fire questions. Uh -huh. uh, Allison asks, or Allison says, I love roughage and asks, what is your favorite recipe from that book? I'll say I had a, a my roommate last year used to make, I believe the braised cabbage mm. recipe that is in roughage. And I cannot stop thinking about that dish this <laughs> and should be making it for myself. But to you, uh, Ro, what's, what is your favorite? Uh, uh, I mean, I also really love the raw cabbage recipe. I mean, cabbage is one of, red cabbage specifically is one of my favorite vegetables. So I, I just, I make that salad a lot where there's something kind of sweet and something kind of spicy. Um, that recipe has a charred melon um, which, you know, fun fact, that recipe was developed because someone sent me an edible arrangement and I was like, so unwilling to waste that rock hard melon that I was like, well, how on earth are we going to eat this? And so I pan fried it and it, it was delicious. And so now I do that with melon. Um, and I just made it the other night with some dates instead of the melon and then kind of a spicy chili oil and some cilantro. Um, so I like that one a lot. Um, I also really like all of the purees that are in roughage. It feels again, like kind of that crossover between restaurant food and home cooking um, where it doesn't, you know, they, they make great in big batches and you can freeze them, um, but it's like an, an extra step. And so I like those a fair amount. Thank you. Alex, do you have a favorite recipe from? Oh roughage? God, I haven't, I haven't cooked out of roughage in a while. I didn't, I can't, I, I, I couldn't say with certainty. <laughs> Sorry, Abra. <laughs> no, no, that's you mean, and that's actually one of the goals of these books is that um, you know, there was another Amazon review that said the recipes were of grist were 100 percent underwhelming. And I was like, hmm, that's all right. Uh, you know, I've never been hundred percent at anything except my fourth grade meat <laughs> test. Uh, but anyway, um, the point of these books is also not to make them recipes that you have to continue to follow each step. They're really meant to be tools that hopefully people internalize the ingredients or the techniques and then feel like they have mastered that enough to cook in their own kitchen. So, um, you know, you're an accomplished cook, Alex. And so hopefully there's just like something from those books that sort of unwittingly has ended up in your food and that makes people feel confident in their own kitchens. And, and I always said that one of my benchmarks for success for roughage would be if someone emailed me and said, I really love this book. Um, I didn't cook any of these recipes or these variations, but I did this instead. And it was based off of a technique or something like that. Like that to me is the, is the dream. Uh, side note, the dream for grist or the benchmark for success is that uh, somewhere in the book, I'm not going to uh, spoil it for anybody, but there is an email address uh, where I encourage people to email me and I like the benchmark for success will be if anyone ever emails me at that email address and it hasn't happened yet. So it's, it's not that successful was, of a book yet, but I was just reading that one today and I thought, <laughs> did she create this Gmail? Is oh yeah. You did? Yeah, 100%. I was and like, I check it sure, a fake. periodically, just waiting, just waiting for someone oh, wow. to send me an email. So go hunting. Well, Thank if you're you. watching, it's it's real. You can really email it. You can find you can search it out. <laughs> Like, we should even, you know, this is what we'll do for the listeners here. If you, whoever is the first to email me, I just did a thing with Wustoff uh, and they sent me a nice knife. And so if anybody from this talk who reads this emails me at that email address saying you heard this on Literati, I'll send you a, a brand new Wustoff knife. Uh, so yeah, it's a little game show we've got running. You here. also should <laughs> probably cook that recipe just for like bonus points. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Stay on book. Yeah. <laughs>
reason we're here today. Let's, yeah. That's incentive to purchase Gris, which you can do uh, at the links that are in the chat. There I've also go, posted uh, links to purchase The Fate of Food and One Pot Planned Planet uh, from our store as well, if you're interested in any of the other books Alex and Everett talked about this evening. Uh, thank you both so much for joining us this evening on At Home with Literati. It's so great to see both of you. Hope to have you in the store soon or in person in the not too distant future for for the next book uh, but until then we hope you continue to stay safe and be well and to all of our viewers thank you so much for joining us we'll see you at the next event take care all have a great night thanks, thanks everybody